which are very interesting, but perhaps a little less well known than the parenchymal lesion. And what is the, the extra axial space where the, these lesions are developed? It is in between skull and brain. It contains meninges, vessels, and CSF. And the, the aim of this extra axial space is exchanges and protection of the brain. And just a little anatomical reminder, the, the meninges are cons consist of two layers, dura, which is the package, <coughs> and arachnoid and pia, that are the left meninges. The dura just is glued to the skull and is separated from uh, the brain by the arachnoid, which contains the CSF and vessels, and the pia, which is just against the sulky and gyre of the brain. And as you see, the vessels are just penetrating the brain, followed by CSF and pia. If you have a more acute view of the dura, you can see that there are two layers the external layer that is glued to the skull and internal layer. In between the skull and external layer is the epidural space which is virtual that can be invaded by blood for example. And in between the two layers of the dura is the subdural space which can be also invaded by many things and by blood. The sinuses that contain veins, blood, are dig, are dug in between the two layers of the dura mater. And in these sinuses, there are some expansion of the arachnoid. And these expansions are forming the patchy granulation that plays a very important play, a part in, in the exchanges in between blood and CSF. And the perivascular spaces, you can see there here, containing CSF, follow uh, uh, with a um, different distance the vessels and can be enlarged and responsible for cystic formation in the brain was that big. So when you have a mass to depict if it's extra axial or not, you have some clues. First clue is to look at the cortex. When we have uh, an extra axial mass, the cortex is uh, in between the brain and, and the skull. And it is just pushed by the mass, as you can see here and here. The CSF is around the mass. The meninge, when the mass is enhanced, is enhanced the same way. And it is the famous dural tail often seen in meningioma, but it's not the only um, cause of dual tail. The parenchyma is often with a little edema, and there are some bone changes, especially in meningiomas. When you have something around the brain that takes the contrast medium that enhance, it is very interesting to see if it is a dura or the leptomangial layer because the, the etiology of the pathologies are a little different from each, each kind of manager. When you have a very thick enhancement that doesn't follow the sulky and gyre, it is the, the dura matter. When it is thin and it follows all the brain gyre and sulky, it is a leptomeningeal enhancement that can be very well seen at the bottom of the cerebellar hemisphere, like a linear enhancement, and that can be very well depicted as little spots, you see, on, on the vermis. This is a meningeal enhancement, a leptomeningeal enhancement, and it is often associated with cranial nerves, <coughs> and the layer that is around the cranial nerves enhancement. So, we know that the mass is extra-axial, and what is it? The clinical data, the shape and signal, and the associated abnormalities, such as brain edema, or some different things, like, like the bone changes, will orient our diagnosis. And to, to, to be simple, we'll separate different problems. The first problem is, I have a focal lesion, 
and it is tissue. The first, the first and the main cause of this lesion is a tumor, it's the melanjo. If you, if you don't have any look at the images, if somebody says there is an extra axial mass, you say it's a meningioma, you have 80% chance to be, to be right. The meningioma is very well defined, generally. It's a focal thickening of the dura. It can be nodular of N plaque. It is a broad-based dural attachment. It enhances a lot after injection, unless it is completely calcified. There are bone uh, modifications on, on, uh, on the, just uh, near the, the meningioma, like hyper uh, um, osteosis or some pikes, and which are very specific of meningioma. When the meningioma is huge, it is often cystic. It can show calcification, which are very well seen on CT or on MR. And this is a cystic meningioma with a very big cyst and calcification and edema. And it has any location, even if it's most of the time supratentorial. And edema is, you see, world frequency is more than half of the meningioma have a, a little edema. And you have several examples of meningioma, the frontal meningioma with a big enhancement. Often in, in the meningioma, you, you can have like layers, like, like little channels that represent this, so that it's easy to, to see. When you have a sinus, uh, cameron sinus uh, meningioma, it has two different layers. You see, the, the external layer is often uh, clearer than, than the internal layer. It often has an effect on, on the carotid artery. And often there is uh, an extension in the skull. And the bone modification can be, of course, destruction, lysis, uh, and uh, calcification. And there is another one that you must be aware of. It is the dilatation of a sinus, and this it is called the pneumosinus sinus dilatans uh, at the contact of the meningeal. Uh, sometimes it's more unusual, like completely calcified meningioma, or uh, with fatty infiltration, as you can see on this different CT scan with the, the dark signal, uh, the dark density of the, the, the fat, and the, the white fat on T1 that is just uh, erased by the, the fat sac. Well, and the bone invasion is very important to depict because it conditions the, the therapeutic issue as if you have a meningioma and bone invasion, you have to remove all the bone to avoid the relapse <coughs> of the meningioma. And some meningioma, very few, 2% are malignant. When you use advanced technique that can be used if you are hesitating, the perfusion is very typical because it is really hyper perfused. And if you do some spectral MRI, the, the most prominent characteristic is the, the, the presence of an alanine peak. And of course, there is no uh, NAA. But it's not the only cause of, mass, uh, of the meninges. It can be a metastasis. Of course, the clinical data are important. It is often a biconvex max with more or less more diffuse meningeal uh, involvement. It has often a calvary location, and the bone modifications differ from those of the meningioma because it's generally an irregular lysis. And this is very specific. In this case, it was a metastasis of a prostate cancer, and the, the <coughs> metastasis first involved the skull and invaded secondary the meninge. Another case of breast metastasis. This mass, which is very uh, atypical, and you could say that this is a, um, a meningioma, but there is another one, very small one, and the patient has a breast cancer, so you can't say meningioma, you have to say metastasis, even if breast cancer and, and, meta, uh, and meningioma have as the same, the same uh, age of uh, appearance, it's uh, 50, uh, 60 women, and it's very, sometimes it's difficult to make the difference. And other malignant tumors, more seldom, can invade the meningeum, uh, the meninge, such as lymphoma. And it was a lymphoma, and you can see that even if you are very good neurologist, you can't get its lymphoma unless you perform a diffusion. It, it, it is an old case, so there is no diffusion in this case. We just give up with the tumors. It can be infection or inflammation. 
and sarcoidosis must be very present on, on your mind anytime you analyze uh, a neurological file. And sarcoidosis uh, can have those broad uh, tumor based extraction lesion. Of course, it's often a meningeal uh, lesion, but it can really look like this. And the most uh, frequent location is this location uh, on, on the cavernous sinus. And you see that on T2, it's very dark. It's really darker than the meningeal. Tuberculosis, and you see that all looks alike. And if you don't have the clinical data, it's very difficult to make the difference in between metastasis, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis. Meningema is le less, le less probable because the, 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 the lesion is very irregular. And, and there is an oedema, but, but tuberculosis, you must think of tuberculosis when you have a, a, a known tuberculosis. The lesion can be also not depending on the, meninge, on, the, on the meninge. For example, this lesion is extraxial. It has a high signal on T2, a high signal on T1. It could be fat, it could be blood. The, the, the most simple way to, to, differ, to make the difference in between the two uh, uh, lesions is to use fat sat and in fat sat the lesion just disappears it's a lipoma when you have a high signal lesion on, on the medial line it, it's often a lipoma extension of skull lesion skull lesion can be for example an hemangioma which, which goes in the, the bone and goes in, in the uh, extra dural and subdural space. Use, when you have a calvarian lesion, when you have a vault lesion, use largely the CT scan to complete your MR. And is, if in MR it's not so easy to make the diagnosis, on, on a CT scan is extremely uh, suggestive. When you have a lesion that is extra axial and touches the sinuses, Think of doing your injection with a venous, um, 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 a venous study just to check the, the, the sinus, to see if the sinus still flows or is invaded because it will uh, offer the surgeon the possibility to, to choose the, the, the way we operate the patient. It can be also a non meningoatelial benign and malignant lesion. So such as chondroma or sarcoma. If the focal lesion is now a cyst, universal cyst, the, the most frequent <coughs> is the arachnoid cyst, which can uh, thin the, the, the vault, and, and the, the arachnoid cyst has the same signal than the CSF on all <coughs> sequences, T2 or diffusion. It can be an epidermoid cyst, and the epidermoid cyst has the same signal of the CSF on T1 and T2, but on diffusion, as the liquid is really thick, there is a high signal on B.